Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to the OKC Latino Young Professionals Group uh, for another live conversation. Uh, my name is Miriam Campos, and um, I'm so excited about today's topic and our guest. Um, I, I've known him for a while, but I'm really excited for you to hear from him. Um, and please remember that we are always here to provide you with um, connections and resources that uh, will benefit your personal development. So please feel free to reach out to us. But um, with that, I'm going to bring him on and say hello. Hi, Anthony. Hey, Miriam. Uh, it's great to be here with you. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. So I haven't seen you in such a long time, but I know we've been talking a lot. Um, yes. So I'm just going to go ahead and introduce you so we can get started on a little bit of, of your background. Um, so you have a master's in public health. You um, have been to I Iraq. Um, you're yes. a veteran. And so we thank you for your service. Uh, you're a life coach, uh, the creator of the Strong Method, which I'm really excited about that. And then what we are here for today, especially, is that you're hosting the Latino Entrepreneur Summit. So super excited to hear about all this. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited to be sharing it with you. It's, uh, it's a lot of great things going on. So definitely excited to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, this you've accomplished a lot. So um, I want to tell everyone about yourself. So Tell us a little bit about um, where you grew up and so we can get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town in California. It was a small farming community. And what I mean by that is uh, agriculture is in the, they call it the armpit of, of uh, America, the California, it's Central Valley. And it's where uh, I grew up and it's, it's a small place. There's really, when I was growing up, there was around 16,000 people. It was big enough where you didn't know everybody. So, so I'm sure I'm sure there's some people in some places are like that is tiny. Like, did everybody know each other? In fact, I actually lived in in a in a in Alaska in this island where there was 9,000 people, and it was like that's that was small. So you pretty much, you know, if you went to the grocery store or you went anywhere, you most likely were going to run into someone that you knew or at the barber shop or something. So 16,000 was big enough to where not everybody knew each other, but still a very small uh, farming community, uh, mostly um, Mexican Americans, uh, Mexicans uh, in this in this town. So very, 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 very little um, Caucasian people. And I think we had there was maybe one or two African-American families. Other than that, it was all Mexicans. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, I grew up in California too. We grew up in Victorville. So I know it's, it's, it's kind of a small town as well. <laughs> yes. Yes. So tell us about where you're currently living. Yeah. I currently live in Medellin, Colombia, and I've been here for a little over two years now. And I actually, had no plans to really live anywhere uh, specifically. I, I bought a one-way ticket to South America uh, two and over two years ago, and I stopped in a couple places throughout uh, Colombia and took a trip to uh, Venice, Italy, over to Italy, a couple places over there. And then I came back, just, just how things were, there was an event over there and I found out about it while I was here. And I was like, hey, my chance to go to Italy. So I went over there, came back, and my next stop was to, actually I was in Medellin for a couple of days before I left to, to Italy. And then I came back and <laughs> like within a week, I'm like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> this, this, is, this place is incredible. So it's nothing, you know, one of the things I appreciate so much about traveling is you really get to know, um, you know, you, you hear oftentimes these dangerous places and, and, and of course, don't get me wrong, it's still, you know, there, there's places in everywhere in the, in the world. There's places where in my hometown, places outside, you're, you're, there's places you're not going to go to, you know, and, and just if you have no business being there, you're not, you shouldn't be there. So, and that's everywhere. So, and including Medellin, including the world. So um, I came here, absolutely fell in love with it. And uh, I've been here ever since. So, and I love it. <laughs> well, 
I know we're going to get into just how everything has happened and how you got there, but how neat is that? We are international. We are all the way right. in well, Colombia. Yes. Yeah, so speaking of Latinos all around the world, and and I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm from the United States, I'm an American, but you know, being here, uh, I love it. You know, and just the culture and the people, the language. Mm -hmm. Wow, fell in love with it. Yeah. So, and I know you've been to Oklahoma too. <laughs> so you've been all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd love for people to learn a little bit about um, what you do currently and what your current profession is. I know I mentioned a couple different things, but I'd love, I'd love to get a little bit more on, on more details so you can tell everybody about that. Yes. Yeah, so what I currently do is I'm a men's coach and uh, I help men in finding that that happiness and fulfillment in themselves. Oftentimes, um, you know, as men, we're not really encouraged to find that fulfillment and happiness in in in, in ourselves. And I can and how I got into being a men's coach is I actually um, went to Iraq in 2009, 2010, and shortly after, you know, uh, coming back from that deployment. You know, I ended up finding myself in a divorce, ended up finding, you know, uh, losing a lot of things that uh, basically not coming back home to the same thing and then began to suffer from uh, PTSD, definitely had some mental health issues where I ended up getting help for that. And while I was so long story short, so while I was um, getting help for that, I was pursuing my my education. I had the opportunity to go back to school. And at this time, I hadn't completed my bachelor's nor my master's degree. And so as I was getting uh, treatment, as, as I was going, getting uh, mental health uh, help, I was pursuing my education. And so long story short, I ended up working as a health educator and uh, absolutely loved my job, loved everything about it. And I had the opportunity to conduct a men's health workshop for Men's Health Month, which is the month of June. And mm -hmm. it was this opportunity that I had that I absolutely loved it. And so one of the things I did was I, con I conducted surveys. So I handed out these surveys before the event and after. I wanted to know exactly what information men knew before my presentation and what they were able to um, get out of the presentation. And so out of res the results of those that uh, survey, you know, a lot of men were uh, suffering from a lot of uh, a lot of things that I can relate to and 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 understand. And, I, and and as I looked back at my education, so my bachelor's is in health promotion, health behavior, and then my master's degree is in public health. And never once, like of course, my health classes like incorporated, you know, everybody, uh, men and women. And so what? Uh, but I just there was nothing really, and there there were things like specifically for women, uh, child health and maternity, those sorts of things, but in having a child, like men contribute half of the equation. And yet when, when, when family, when, when people are a couple or planning family, whatever it happens, there's never no mention about the men and, and taking care of his health. And it's like women, right? What's the first thing they tell you? Oh, start taking your folic acid, start taking your vitamins, start taking, you know, de decrease your stress and all these things, but nothing about men and, and, and how, they contribute to the to the equation, how it's important for them uh, to be just as healthy as well for the woman as the woman. So all these things that I was just being uh, my own experience. And of course, from the time I started to the time I presented this this um, summit or this uh, workshop was seven years. So it was seven years of, mm -hmm. of different therapy, different, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, all these different things. So I'm kind of giving you the, the short uh, story of it, uh, to keep it, um, keep it short. So eventually I became a men's uh, coach where I help men in different areas of their life. But uh, it started off as, as helping men with, with health issues, but it really eventually got down to, you know, the struggle of of um, their just their lack of happiness and their lack of fulfillment in their life, which prevents them from being the best husband they could be, the best father they could be, the best man, best contributor to society. And it's just that there's not a and and a, oftentimes it is, um, yeah. We call it mental health in these days today. But I remember when I was a very young man, 
for a boy, you know, um, I had zero self-esteem. And back then we called it self-esteem. Today, you know, there are some mental health, you know, like, like that we would consider, you know, even back then, these mental health um, uh, issues. And so we call it mental health today, but it's really a lack of self-esteem. It's really a lack of confidence. It's a lack of focus and direct, uh, um, uh, you know, setting goals and, and moving forward to, or moving towards those goals. Then when we don't have that in our life, um, we end up doing other things that aren't constructive for us. And we, we're not the best, uh, like I mentioned, the best husbands, the best fathers and the best people in, in society. Well, I, one, thank you for sharing that because I know that, um, like you said, for specifically males, there aren't very many proactive resources. Um, and then also, um, today I just heard it on the podcast where they were saying that exact same thing that, you know, men sometimes just come into the equation thinking that you know exactly what to do when you have a child and so that you just know and it, yeah. it's absolutely not 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 true there are some things that could be helpful through the process and that could be for your profession and life in general so absolutely i, I definitely know what you're what you're talking about there but yes. so when you say coaching um for example now so for mm -hmm. For someone that, so you mentioned a couple of examples of how you help them, but for mm -hmm. some of these young Latino professionals that maybe are listening, um, how would you be able to to help them directly in, in what they do day to day? You know, one of the things that I'll go back to when I was in the depths of my suffering, you know, uh, I knew, luckily for me, I was in a meditation. I was open as far as um, just looking at different uh, modalities and uh, as far as health goes and, you know, reading books. And I, I was luckily I had uh, it wasn't a, a mentor. He was a mentor indirectly. But I just remember getting into these books that really talked about the mind and really talked about the brain and these sorts of things. And I remember when uh, about one of my first classes that I took after when I started taking classes after my deployment, um, mind you, I was only taking online classes because I didn't want to be around anyone. Yeah. So yeah. one of the first classes that I took was on CAM. Um, let's see, I was always it's it, it I was always saying uh, contemporary, but it's actually um, com, what is it? Uh, I used to say contemporary for some reason and alternative medicines. It's comparative. No, not comparative. I forget what it's called. It's where you're 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 these these different ways of 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 um, promoting health or, or utilizing different means to promote health. And so um, this class really opened up my eyes to uh, the many different things that we have available that aren't medication, that aren't these sorts of things. And so one of the things that um, I later came to realize was the importance of brain and the brain health, because every decision that we make, right, is where, is where does it come from? It comes from our brain. And if your brain's not working properly, you're not thinking properly. You could be easily frustrated. You could be easily angered. You could do, you know, things that, that don't allow you to focus and concentrate. So for the young people who are, you know, watching, you know, one of the things I wish I knew at a much younger age is to read about the brain and understand how the brain works and under, and, and to also feed yourself uh, books about um, your thoughts and about your, your, your mindset and not just from a business perspective or even from a sports perspective, just really in life and how, you know, I could have easily stayed in that depression and that anxiety. I could have, I mean, and, and unfortunately many veterans do, mm -hmm. um, but I knew I wanted something better for my life and I went out to search for it. And luckily, um, and I think it was that class that, that really set the, the, the tone for me to eventually study health and to get my bachelor's and my master's degree in health. So what I would really say is you've got to feed your mind. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you, you can get access to these books of, from people that have written incredible books um, on these certain topics. Read about 
um, business, read about mindset, read about um, personal performance as it pertains to physical, but also how that correlates with you as a, as a future um, entrepreneur or business owner, because it eventually, as an entrepreneur, and we'll talk about this later, but it, it's all about mindset because eventually when it comes down to it, you're putting yourself out there. Um, and when it when really, really, really want to dive it down, uh, you're in the business of sales and no one wants to their their job right they don't, no one wants to go out and get a sales job you know a quote unquote sales job but when you have your own business and you're you're talking to potential investors you're talking to your potential client or customers you're selling and if you're not confident in yourself and confident in what you're providing um you're not going to make it very far so that's what i would say that's absolutely right and I feel like it's harder when you're talking about yourself sometimes that, you know, it's, it's harder to think of, I have to sell myself. Um, <laughs> but, but I love that. Um, and you mentioned entrepreneurs. So I'm going to kind of just dive into that. Uh, so let's talk about the Latino Entrepreneur Summit. Um, yes. How did, how was this born? Yeah, so the the summit begins the 15th. You could sign up now. It's a free online event. It's really it, it's an opportunity to listen to Latino entrepreneurs who are doing incredible things. You know, they all have these incredible stories of how they started their business, why they started their business, and then um, and then the, to hear their stories, and then also to hear about the the tips and the strategies and the suggestions that they would have for anyone considering um, starting a business. So one of the, I actually, I've wanted to put this project on for a very, very long time. I've always tried to find a way, find ways how I can contribute to the Latino community. When I was in my undergrad, I had the, uh, I was awarded a prestigious scholarship called the Benjamin A. Gilman scholarship. And this, what they have you um, afterwards, they, they want you to, um, uh, share what you experienced. And for me, I went to Ecuador. I did a, I conducted an internship, a public health internship in Ecuador, um, kind of almost in the jungle. I mean, it was right at the border of the jungle in the Amazon mountain. And so it was, it was absolutely incredible. And so, so when you do submit your application, you got to, you know, you have to have some sort of ideas, like what do you want to do as far as your uh, project that you want to um, after when you come back. And so, I eventually became an ambassador for that program because I absolutely believe in it. And it's really an opportunity for um, unrepresented people, students to get the opportunity to study abroad because studies have shown uh, it, you, your mind is just so vastly open when you get to experience a different culture. Even though they speak Spanish and there's some similarities, it's a different culture. And they, they think differently. They believe in different things. Their spirituality, their, just the way they look at the world. So when you get those opportunities and you go back to your community, you see the world totally different. Uh, that's one of the things that I absolutely love about traveling around the world is that you your mind is expanded in, in so many different ways because not everyone does the same thing or believes the same thing in the whole entire world, right? It's kind of, that concept is easy to necessarily understand, but you not necessarily really drive home unless you've done it. And I know you've done some traveling yourself too. So, um, so basically my project afterwards was to um, uh, share this with other Latino uh, students. And uh, I end up having, oh man, I think I end up having like over 16, people from my university from oregon state university that were uh, eventually a reward or awarded uh with um a scholarship to study abroad now i don't know where all those where all the people went to um but it was incredible because i absolutely believe in um in higher education and those things so even though i um so going back to this whole latino entrepreneurs uh, summit um i've always wanted to contribute as far as like entrepreneurship and business and how um, I have been impacted in it myself because my mother, mm -hmm. she took a risk when I was eight, nine, I don't remember, we, I was really young uh, and we didn't have anything. I grew up very, I mean, we very, um, I've heard it saying uh, here recently, we used to call it poor 
now we call it humble beginnings. <laughs> like we barely, barely had anything. Um, I grew up on rice and beans uh, and literally because that's, you know, and <laughs> not because it was my part of my culture, but I mean, part of it was, but <laughs> I remember my grandmother, uh, two things that always will always stick in my head is that I remember when my grandmother would, she would come at night and she would bring like this bucket, uh, this small little container or this container of um, government dried milk because she stood in line all day for like yeah, these government yeah. handouts, right? And, um, and we ended up getting like, you know, my grandmother was so worried about us. And then I remember my grandfather uh, coming, picking up my brother because my mom couldn't afford to, to buy him any shoes. So we used to call it poor. Now we call it Hubble and Beginnings. But either way you want to call it, we definitely didn't have much. So anyhow, long story short, my mother ended up starting a, a, her own business. And slowly but surely, she um, basically, long story short, all of her dreams have basically have come true. And she's an inspiration uh, for me. And uh, she's, a, she's a strong woman. And she, uh, she has a work ethic that to this day, I don't even touch. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, she still inspires me. And she still has her business. It's been, uh, I think, close to, well, um, yeah, over 30 years. And so, um, so she... Uh, and, and I've just, and I've also, and I have other uncles who, um, who have uh, their own businesses and have done extremely well. And my grandmother, and I think it really started with my grandmother because even though my grandparents, they worked out in the fields, they worked in packing houses. And I said, pack, do you know what I mean by when I say packing houses? I, I know you mentioned it. Um, yeah, with, with, yeah, with yeah, yeah, somewhere your, else, right? Your latest yeah, podcast. Completely. <laughs> yeah. So she's like, what's a packing house? <laughs> and so I'm like thinking, cause, cause that term, right. We, I gotta be careful with that. Cause to me, like packing house, you know what that is, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so other people may not be like, no, what's a packing house? Like, what do you mean? A packing house, if you don't know, is, is your fruit doesn't just walk to the grocery store. Right. <laughs> so it gets picked from the tree or ground, gets into a box, travel somewhere to a packing house that's where then it ends up getting into bo smaller boxes and out to the grocery store as it goes so my grandparents worked at the um fields and they worked in packing houses and eventually retired from from those but one of the things my grandma would would do is she would um make food for everyone so when she went out in the field it was like she made food for everybody so she was just yeah, you yeah. know and that was kind of like trying to earn extra money to to, <laughs> to you know to bring because most of the workers were um from mexico and didn't have their families and young and different you know demographics and as far as age goes and so my grandmother would do that and then also so then they would also she would also make dinner and so my mother would go to school and then come home and then start helping my grandmother cook. And so my mom just has this, like, she doesn't know how to relax. I mean, my mom's incredible, but I have to, I've had to teach her how to relax over these years because my mother, she grew up um, basically at the time where she can help basically when she was, you know, able to, you know, four or five years old, um, go to the fields in the morning with my grandparents and then when it uh, work there. And then when it, when she was in school, uh, she would get up two, three hours before school, go and help pick some fruit, come back home, work, uh, uh, get ready for school, go to school and then come back and help with the family and cooking dinner and stuff. And she did that basically all of her life until she, she got married or until she, she moved down. So she was 18 years old and that, that was my mother's life. Wow. wow. So you come from a family of entrepreneurship. Um, I know my dad himself is an entrepreneur. And I think they just come with that desire to work hard and, uh, you know, teach their, their families to have something of their own. So I think well, that has led you to also get inspired. Um, and so I want to tell some of our um, viewers, with the Latino Entrepreneur Summit, um, Let's talk about some of the, the speakers that are going to be a part of the summit so that they can get excited about it. Yeah. So every, as I mentioned, every person that is on the summit is, has an incredible story. And 
uh, for the most part, some of them, you know, started with absolutely nothing. And one of the things, though, that they're, they did go out and some of them went to college, some of them then, you know, worked in the corporate field and then eventually led them to start their own business. Um, and some people just, uh, you know, they, they, they had these skills, these certain skills just from different jobs that they had. Mm -hmm. And then they just utilize those skills and realize, wait, you know, I could start a business doing this. Like, I don't, you know, necessarily have to get any certifications or any school or whatever. Like, I literally can help people with what I'm doing. And some people were, were just like, uh, they would, that, that's, they just transitioned from doing something maybe on the side as they, you know, were, were had a regular job and then eventually went into, um, their, their business and their job. So that's how, so every story has been very inspirational because, they, you know, and um, some have, uh, I'll give you an example. One of them is Victor Antonio. He yeah. uh, is Puerto Rican. He was, he was raised in Chicago. And, and it, it's quite interesting because I actually spoke with him on the phone like over 15 years ago. This is when, because Victor used to be a um, college motivational speaker. And I was looking at becoming a motivational speaker for Latinos at that time myself. And I did, I did a, a number of different um, uh, speeches for or presentations to Latino youth and absolutely loved it. And I, I've done different things, but at that time, and I just remember him giving me this, this advice. And it was so incredible because with my company, Strong Men, Strong is an acronym for something. And we go over that, but he told me this when you, you know, he told, he gave me this advice. And so when I still remembered it, when I had that short conversation with him. And then, so when I started, you know, uh, inviting people for the uh, summit and I came across Victor, I'm like, this is so incredible. So it was just awesome to reconnect with him and to hear and see what he's been able to do with in the last 15 years. Um, and so He's a, an incredible uh, speaker, uh, works in sales and training, uh, but he he all, he went to, to school, uh, had his humble beginnings, went to college. He realized, you know, all the people that are, you know, making money, they have this college degree, so I'm going to go do that. And of course, um, I'm not sure how old Victor is, but, you know, this was, he's definitely um, older than me. <laughs> and so you know, and I'm in my 40s. So, uh, but uh, so, yeah, so many people are podcasting. People have in their different um, industries. Some are millionaires, some are multimillionaires, some are, you know, six figure businesses, some are doing, uh, some are authors. They're doing work in the United States, they're doing work internationally. You know, for me, I wanted to contribute to the Latino community so that uh, for them to hear these stories. Um, because, you know, Dr. Robert um, Drenteria, you know, his story is about working hard. He was in the military, special forces, you know, had his duffel bag and, you know, some money in his pocket and just, you know, worked hard. And he, and I love his story because, you know, his was all about, I just worked harder than everybody else was. I worked the weekends when nobody was wanting to work weekends. I worked the hours. I worked the holidays when nobody was wanting to. And then that gets noticed. And when, uh, when you're doing a, a um, work, uh, and, and, and it's, and it's producing, uh, others, your work gets recognized and like, Hey, whatever you're doing, can you show everybody else how to do it? Because we want yeah. to <laughs> increase. Right. So it's, you know, we could talk about this too. You know, it doesn't necessarily, you know, many do have college degrees. It doesn't mean you have to have one. Um, we could get in that conversation as well, but I love his story because I do know people who don't have college degrees, but work their butts off yeah. uh, but then but every but that's what I love so much is that everyone's story is different and mm -hmm. so I appreciate their uh, willingness to share their story and then my hope is to just inspire others to um, that are inspired by these stories to connect with whoever you're, you're you feel inspired by and uh, move forward from that yeah, well, I will say I've had a little sneak peek into the <laughs> summit and I have been so impressed with um, the speaker so far. You know, like you said, they all have different stories, um, you know, from Maggie Cook. She's 
super inspiring for Latinas and, you know, just showing you how it's done in, in her way. And then you have Jenny Johansson, you have Pam, which is one of my favorites, Pam Covarrubias. She has yeah. her own podcast and um, she does have a podcast with Anthony. So we'll have to tell you uh, where you can listen to that. And she's from California. She talks a lot about her um, experiences and um, I'm now following her and she's awesome. Um, but then you have, you know, stories from Chuck Garcia, who is super intellectually just yes. fascinating. Um, and so I've, I've been looking at these um, different people, but we all connect to them as Latinos. And one of my favorites, of course, um, a well-known friend of ours, uh, Erika Lucas, who is from Oklahoma, she's going to be one of the speakers. And so we, I'm so happy we were able to connect that. Um, yeah. She's fantastic. Uh, so she's going to be on there as well. Um, she's She helps entrepreneurs here in Oklahoma yes. and, and kind of all over. So I feel like this is just bringing so many people from all, all of the U.S. together. How yes. exciting is that? <laughs> Oh yeah, that, and they're yeah they're all from uh, all over the United States. However, there is one from Puerto Rico. Uh, there are some that are from Puerto Rico originally, Cuba, um, uh, mm -hmm. Colombia. It was quite impressive. Where our, uh, you know I, I was reaching out to Latinos, Latinas, and come across uh, Col Colombianas that uh, Colombianos that uh, that are in the United States. So it was awesome. And after I told them, no, I'm in Colombia, they're like, what? <laughs> you're like, you yeah. Know, so they're, it was just exciting to connect. So yeah, there's that's that's what's so incredible because I know the Latino community is, is I, I would say it's fairly small and, and just, you know, in the world in general, I mean, but um, it's great to hopefully, you know, connect, you know, other Latinos to other people who are doing great things and for us to help and support each other, which I think is great. Yeah. So now that we have everyone excited about this summit, um, how do they get access to the summit? Yeah. So they could go to latinoentrepreneursummit.com and it's a free online event that is happening from September 15th through the 21st. And definitely listen, take the time to listen to those stories, take some notes. There's some very, I've had other people um, take a look at the videos too. And they're like, there's some golden nuggets in these videos. <laughs> so, yeah. Take, you know, so these, you are thinking of, uh, you know, launching as an entrepreneur or, or just getting inspired. And I will say that that's what I feel. Um, there's so many motivational stories just within it. So even if you're not ready to start your business, but you just want to get inspired, I, I would absolutely recommend this. But absolutely. I want to kind of go back to you saying this is free and they can access it because that's big. Yes, yes. So, yeah, they definitely can get access to it for free. There, it, you know, if they want to, to keep it, there is an option to, to, to purchase the, the access to the videos, but you know, they get it free and they could check it out every single one of them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. So definitely uh, listening to those uh, stories. It, it's, it's, and, and you're going to, um, all their info. So all the speakers information as well is going to be available. So if you want to connect with any one of them, that's going to be available. So it's just right. We talk about network, uh, especially in the Latino community. And I know what you do. It's, it's, connecting people. I know you're a great connector, right? And so it's when you know other people and, and uh, you just never know when somebody, I know uh, Diego, he, he, uh, Diego Rios, he's in the, uh, he's one of my, the youngest uh, uh, person, um, one of the interviews that I've done or conducted for the Latino summit. And he's doing some great things. And, you know, he gets calls back from uh, talks that he did early on from in schools and stuff. So um, making those connections and, and hearing, uh, you just never know. So it's great. Yeah. So Hispanic Heritage Month is coming up, guys. So if you need something to uh, recommend to your fellow colleagues and friends, please look up the Latino Entrepreneur Summit. Um, and like I said, there's, there's a lot of great information and um, I have been listening to all these different podcasts now from that. So I strongly encourage you to sign up and get your access to it. Um, and 
you kind of mentioned a little bit of a podcast that you have your own podcast. So tell us about your podcast. Yeah. So my podcast is the Strong Men Podcast. And, uh, you know, I started this podcast as a way to contribute and for men to hear more positive messages uh, about men. Unfortunately, you know, in the news and the media, you often just hear about, you know, the bad things that some people are doing. And, and that's unfortunate because, um, as I mentioned, you know, when I was recovering and going through my issues, you know, it was it was me. I was by myself and it was a struggle and things have changed. I mean, it's been 10 years. Uh, definitely things have been have changed. There's more men's uh, positive information out there for men and really understanding like masculinity and like, you know, the, the, the re really what is truly masculinity. And it's not this negative dominant and all this, all, all the other things that really in, uh, oftentimes gets portrayed in the media. So I wanted to provide men with, you know, positive information, information about mental health, information about, you know, their health, wealth, and personal performance really is what uh, the podcast is all about. So uh, yeah, I started that when, in fact, when I, uh, I started that, when I bought my one-way ticket to South America, I started my podcast in a rented bedroom in Bogota, Colombia. And, and I didn't want to have there to be any, um, and I still have the same equipment. I still using the same stuff. I have not changed in two and a half years almost. And I didn't want there to be any excuse. I wanted to prove it to myself. I wanted to show, share it with others and with dogs barking and traffic noise in the background. I'm like, I'm starting this. And, and I, and I did, and it's been two years. I mean, uh, definitely a work in progress as in everything in, in business and, and what we do. But uh, so, yeah, that was uh, I wanted to contribute and give out, you know, more um, inform positive information for men to take care of themselves mentally, physically and physically that allows them then to be healthy, strong fathers and husbands and and um, contributors to society. We need that so much more. So I can't. Um, stress that enough, like that the work you're doing is is so important specifically now. Um, so I'm, if I, if you're not inspired, I am. <laughs> so, um, I'm, you know, I feel like we, we don't do enough for our our men, um, and I just say that personally. You know, family, you just don't see them take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is something that I feel like it's, it's such a a need in our community. Um, so I applaud your work. Um, and I know you're a huge advocate of higher education for Latinos. Um, tell us why. Why are you such a, I know you have a, a, a neat story about this, but I love um, hearing your perspective on, on encouraging Latinos. Yeah. So as, as I mentioned, when, you know, I grew up in a small farming community and most of the people, you know, um, you know, work out in the fields, you know, if all my friends either had their parents or their uncles or, you know, everyone was kind of in that situation. And really, um, higher education was not uh, promoted. Uh, it was basically one of the things that, you know, I just kind of heard was just don't become a high school dropout. Like that was kind of like, okay, you can do whatever you want, but just don't, don't become a high school dropout, you know, finish school, finish your high school, and then you do whatever you want. But there was never anything about, you know, the difference between a career and a job and, and like what, you know, college and, and what that really offers you. And so I wasn't um, encouraged in that way. And, and for me and being in, in this small town, um, you know, I ended up going to the military right out of high school, but I felt like I didn't really feel pressured in any way to join the military out of high school. I have my grandfather fought in World War II, my father in Vietnam, and then eventually later, you know, I served in Iraq. But I, I, I just had a um, natural um, attraction to the military. So I knew that was something that was brought upon myself. I had other uncles who fought in the Korean War. Um, Vietnam era times, but none of them ever, never mentioned anything about being in the war or in the military. There was no kind of, you need to go to the military type of deal thing, serve your country. It was all on me. Um, my high school actually had a, a military program and 
and my senior year or before my senior year, I was actually appointed as the commander of the whole entire uh, um, unit, the whole program. And so I was the highest ranking student. So I knew like that was what I wanted to do. Um, and so long, long, long story short. So, you know, I was in the military and then eventually um, I, you know, uh, had a number of different jobs and, you know, just different things that didn't require a college degree. And I always had um, this desire to complete my degree. And I, and I just remember I was in several different jobs where I would meet people who were in higher up positions and, and they would, ha and, and just to have that job, you would have to have a, a college degree. And I just remember one time I was at this job and uh, working in this construction field and, and I, this day, this specific day, I was picking up just trash around these new construction homes, these constructed homes. And and I just remember my boss and another person coming out of this, driving up. And it was freezing cold that day, freezing cold. And I just remember my my boss and, and this uh, other um, employee coming out and, you know, they're coming out of this warm vehicle and, you know, I'm freezing my tail off. And I'm just, and I'm sitting there and I'm just so like, oh, like what is different be between me and them, right? Like I want to be sitting in that warm car, you know? And oftentimes when I saw myself in these situations, really what separated is just they had a college degree, you know? And so throughout those years, I didn't, I didn't go to Iraq until I was 32. And then by the time I came back, I was, I had turned uh, shortly after I'd come back, I turned 34 and just the way it worked, um, you know, I had 32 and then shortly after I left, I turned 33. And then by the time I came back, I was, I turned 34 and then about four or five months, I started my education and it was during my undergrad that I started taking these sociology classes and it was like this huge light bulb moment. If you ever had like this light bulb moment where like you might have thought and believed something for so long and then you you get this this this, this like it just revealing to you like this car curtain just opened up and you're like, there's the truth, you know, whatever. And and they literally could have put my name in that book and 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 literally like my family and how education and and um the, the opportunities that education afford you. And, you know, basically it wasn't like specifically saying, oh, here's what you get for college and here's what you don't get when you don't have it. It was basically like, here's a diagram of unemployment. Here's your, here's your, here, you know, whenever, uh, um, based off of your education, you know, there's the small and the less education you have just increased, right? And, and your chances of, of getting a job during, you know, tough times is very low compared to, you know, someone who has an education. And so um, I ended up going to school for, for six years, my bachelor's and my master's degree. And it was just a huge eye opening because not only was I one of the very few Latinos in my classes, but then when I, by the time I got to my master's degree or uh, graduate uh, studies, um, you know, there's like very even more uh, or less, I should say, uh, Latinos. And I remember yeah. when I was in my undergrad and I remember, you know, when they would show like, OK, who has college degrees? And there's like the bar graph, you know, it's like here's your white Caucasian. Here's your Latin or here's your, your, your African-American. And then here's your, you know, your Latinos. And it's just like this this kid in a candy store who just like got a handful of candy. I'm looking at my ID card. And thinking, like this, I'm like in college, man. <laughs> like this is like this is this is amazing. Like I like I belong here. Now this is just starting, right? I hadn't started. I haven't. I, I hadn't started doing any homework or anything like that. Like oh, um, you know, this is just me getting in. And I just remember like um, being in my classes and just you know ha learning all this stuff that of what education can provide for you yeah. and i then went to uh, so then i did end up getting my, my master's degree in public health and then i went to work uh, for a health organization and even that job itself there's no way i ever would have gotten that job had i not had a master's degree and here's one of the most powerful things that i remember 
so I always knew I was going to end up in South America at some point. And I remember uh, finishing, I was about to finish graduate school and I was, I was thinking, okay, here's my chance. I'm, I'm going to just go to South America and I'll figure it out, start a business. I'm going to do something. And so, but I was like, you know, I'm going to start putting out some applications and just see what I wait, what I could do. And long, long story short, you know, I applied for the health education job up in Alaska. And I remember when they offered me the job and they told me, you know, what my salary was going to, or, you know, they, what they were going to offer the salary. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to accept that salary. First off, having a master's degree. And two, I know how expensive it can be to be live in Alaska. So I asked them for $20,000 more per year for what they offered. So I, what they offered me for my yearly salary, I asked for 20,000 more. Well, as you know, I did end up taking that job and they said, yes, but there's no way in the world I would, they would have, they would have, uh, accepted that had it not be that I had a master's degree. There's no way you can't, that's my bargaining chip. Like then I go and I work uh, there and everyone has master's degrees. And then at one point they were, um, we, they hired a, an assistant for me and there was somebody, they both had relatively the same level of education or I'm sorry, the level of experience. One had a master's degree and one had a bachelor's. So who do you think got the job? The person with the master's degree, everybody in the health department all had master's degree. And then I go and I, I'm working on these projects with doctors and other people who have health degrees and, you know, I'm sitting in these boardrooms and, you you know, I just remember one time they were passing around the, you know, this check-in form, you know, right? You're signing mm -hmm. in. And everybody has initials after their name, MD, MPH, you know, all these different um, health, uh, you know, master's degrees and doctorate degrees. And you just never would be there. So uh, I would never have been there had I not uh, had my master's degree. And for me, when I even as far up as Alaska or everywhere I go in the world, I'm thinking, especially at that moment, I was thinking, like, I barely graduated high school. I, I don't think I've mentioned that. Like, I barely graduated. The only thing, <laughs> the only thing I wanted to do was to make sure I completed um, or was to get in the entrance exam to the military. And I'll share a quick story about that to show you how, like, how bad it or not bad, but let's just say to get into the military. It's called the ASVAB, and I, I forget what the ASVAB stands for. Um, but it's the test you take to get into the military. If 32, the, the score of 32 was to get in, I got a 33. Okay. I, I'm not even kidding you. And, and I, yeah. And, and here's the thing, Miriam, like, I don't know, perhaps you get a 32 just for putting in your name, right. And circling the circles that you're supposed to, like, I don't know. But I could tell you right now, I got a 33. And what's so funny about that is, and I remember that specifically because my recruiter, I'm sitting in the car on the back passenger seat where he can see me. And I remember him looking at me and I remember him telling me saying, what's wrong? And I'm like, I was so disappointed in myself. I, I felt so dumb. And he's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I barely passed. And he was just excited that he got it and met his quota or something, you know, like, <laughs> great. You just, you know, be happy. You get to join in. And, yeah. And, but was so in, and here's one of the most interesting thing is, is I eventually finished, I finished my bachelor's and I, I, I graduated with honors for my bachelor's degree and I ended up getting a, my master's degree. And right before I graduated with my master's degree, I ended up having an opportunity to speak to a group of Latinos who were part of a program to encourage them to go to college. And I remember sharing this story with them. I go, look, I had to start out when I went back to college, I had to start out basic algebra. I mean, the low of the low, I mean, low of the low. I mean, I'm 36 years old. I'm starting, you know, and, and, and so I had tutors. I had tutors for, I mean, math, it was mostly math, but I had tutors and I was telling these young Latinos, I'm like, look, do you care or, you know, for someone to, um, if somebody's making fun of you that you need to have a tutor for math and I'm like, like, who cares? Cause look, I have a master's degree. I'm laughing all the way to the bank. 
So all those people who are probably laughing at, you know, whatever, I didn't care because who has a master's degree? Who now can basically do anything he wants? And so, you know, it doesn't matter if you're not good at math. It doesn't matter if you're not good at science. You could get tutors and figure it out. And of course, in master's program, as you know, like there's I had to take. <laughs> I had to take bio stats. I mean, she, I mean, you know, this is coming from someone who barely graduated high school and barely passed the military entrance exam, <laughs> you know? So if there, if I could do it, you know, I mean, I really hope that I'm inspiring someone that you can, you could do it too. Cause I mean, for me, that's, and so going back to your original question, it was that there are jobs that you have to, have a, a bachelor's degree or more. And in fact, I have an uncle who in his 50s, um, he he was a, a police officer and, and or an, uh, was an investigator. And for him to become the chief investigator uh, and to be promoted to that job, didn't matter if you had 30, 40 years in the business in that, for, in that field, you have to have a bachelor's degree. You have to, it's the requirement. There's no going around it. Doesn't matter who you know, you, and so he went back to school at 50 something, I think he's late 50, I, I don't remember. Um, definitely it's been a while to get his bachelor's degree because he knew he was going to be a prime candidate to be the chief of uh, investigation for uh, in California. And he did, but he had to have that bachelor's degree. And here's the thing, if he didn't do it, who most likely was prepared and ready for that? Most likely you know, or white counterpart, you know, just, you know, yeah. somebody else, not a Latino, right? So in order for us to, and, and people to hear, uh, and for us to have different viewpoints, like where we come from and what we have seen and experienced our life contributes to the betterment of health, law, mm -hmm. you know, all these different things that require, you know, um, a, a bachelor's or a master's degree or more. And if we don't have those rep representations or representation, all you know, how can we then have that um, contribute to um, you know the betterment of health in our communities, the betterment mm -hmm. of health of our uh, of, of communities, uh, Latino communities throughout um, throughout the country, and how will they know what? How will they, the people who are making the decisions? take uh, in consideration what the Latino community is going through, right? Yeah. And so you can't be at the table. doesn't mean you can't contribute. I'm not saying like you can't be successful. You can't contribute to your community without a college degree. But there are people who are making decisions on your behalf because yeah. you don't have that education, right? But we need people to, like us, who are representing uh, um that have positions in that, in those fields that do require a bachelor's degree or more. Yeah. yeah. We talk a lot about that, you know, representation is key. And, um, you know, I, I think again, just to highlight what you mentioned is it doesn't matter what age you are in currently. Um, <laughs> you can go back to school at any point in time. And if you're just willing and determined to get to that next level, um, you you can absolutely do whatever you put your mind to. But absolutely. even with um, you know entrepreneurship, there are some 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 jobs and careers that we still need those individuals. So whether you want to be an entrepreneur and have your own business or collaborate. You know, we want there to be a room full of more familiar faces. So that's, I think, a key a key point there. And um, I do want to say hello to Francisco. He said uh, greetings to um, a fellow veteran. He's also a, a veteran. He's nice. Uh, one of our good friends and representatives of the Puerto Rican associations here in Oklahoma. Nice. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, no, there's a lot of great advice that you just provided. Um, but I kind of want to ask you as we're wrapping up this, this conversation, um, you know, you've highlighted a lot about entrepreneurship and then your story. And and I don't want to ruin it because I know there's podcasts and we want you guys to go check those out so you can learn more. But um, what are you doing to manage your own 
wellness. I know people are experiencing so many unique situations as we are going through, you know, this pandemic and, and whatnot. But I know travel is one, but but what else are you doing to manage your, your own wellness? Yeah, that's a good, great question. You know, you've got to move. One of the things that I do, you know, it goes back to the brain and the brain is, is everything. And when you're, um, it, it's very easy to, um, depending on where you're at, I know being here in, in Colombia, like we were really like shut down, like, you know, we were yeah. are closed. I mean, we had to, to stay in put and, or stay inside. And, and I know people in the United States, depending on where you're, you're located, you know, you can go outside at least and you weren't restricted on any specific type of days like we were here. But um, you got to move. One of the best things that I think helped me as far as when I was suffering is really you got to exercise. And, and the reason is, is because you're getting blood flow up into the brain. And when, you, you know, and it's really easy to, um, our, our minds and our, our brain, you know, really um, our thoughts can, can uh, get out of hand. And so one of the things that really um, is vitally important is to be moving, whether you're walking, running, um, you know, doing some sort of exercise, but you've got to take care of, um, uh, think of it more of exercising for the brain because, if you are somebody who is struggling in, in, with anxiety or, you know, these sorts of um, mental issues, uh, the best thing that you can be doing is um, physical exercise. Find something that you enjoy. If it's walking, great, walk. If it's some sort of martial art, some sort of um, group class, group work, I mean, if you can, but even individually um, to do some movement, get your heart rate going, get up because... Um, that then will um, help in that uh, exercise has vital, I mean, so much research that really helps in alleviating um, anxiety, any mental health um, uh, issues going on. So that's, that's what I do. That was one of the things I had to maintain if I felt like I was just like, you know, getting depressed and getting sad and, and getting, feeling lonely and just all these different things. It's just like, you know, I, I, you got to move, you got to move. So that's one of the most important things that I do is, um, is make sure I'm, I'm exercising and, uh, just doing some, some movements, make sure I'm feeding my brain, um, feeding my mind, uh, positive information, really not kind of, uh, diving into any kind of negative stuff, anything that not, is not feeling good. Um, just, you know, really stay away from it and, uh, create your own kind of, um, I remember Monica and Rivera what, listened to that interview in the Latino Entrepreneur Summit. She has a great, I love her routine. She has this morning routine um, that I just think is, is, is great. She'll, she'll, she'll tap in, listen to a little bit of the news and see what's kind of going on, you know, and, and you do, you want to make sure you, you know, you know what's going on. But at the same time after that, it's like listening to some comedy, to some comedy, make me laugh, you know, listen to something. So it was just like, I loved her. Um, I loved her uh, 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 recommendations. Love it. I I definitely agree. I think the exercise is such a good stress reliever. So yes. absolutely. Uh oh, Not sure what happened. Still seeing live, so hopefully <laughs> if you guys can hear me. But yes, want to add in, check out the Latino Entrepreneur Summit and uh, at latinoentrepreneursummit.com. Uh, listen to incredible stories about Latinos who come from many different backgrounds. And, you know, of course, there might be some some similarities um you know but at the same time uh you know i was writing something today about you know there's latinos who have been in space who've been in uh who are medal of honor recipients who have built million dollar businesses from literally nothing and so it's just i wish i would have been exposed to this type of thing when i was younger 
and to, um, you know, to hear uh, other people doing great, uh, incredible things that perhaps, you know, that look like me. And it's not me just trying to imagine myself who from what somebody else is doing that looks nothing like me that doesn't come from where I'm from. And so for me, uh, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure in, um, in interviewing these professionals. So I was talking about uh, the Latino Entrepreneur Summit, but hearing these professionals, um, it's been great to um, hear the tips that they have for uh, aspiring entrepreneurs. And one of the things that I love about it too, and this is not necessarily an event to promote entrepreneurship, but it's definitely one to uh, provide you with great tips and ideas to even to think about um, because entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. But for those that it is for, like I've known for myself, like I, I've always known that I was always going to work for myself and do things. And that was never going to end. Even though I did have jobs and things in the back of my mind, I always knew I was going to have my own business. And that's perhaps where you might be. Um, and so definitely listen uh, into these these tips because I know they they really provide some really deep um, and wonderful insights. Absolutely. Um, I definitely think that you have... So many amazing guests that are going to be um, available, so you don't want to miss it. And again, I want to show you where you can get information for the Latino Entrepreneur Summit. And um, feel free to connect with us if you have any questions about where to find this information. And um, we hope that you'll be able to join September 15th through September 21st. Um, again, you will see some familiar faces there that you will connect with. So um, we hope you can be a part of it. And again, um, Anthony, thank you so much for taking the time all the way from Medellin, Colombia, um, to be with us today and to tell us about this um, summit, which is the first one, right? Um, so you are all getting an insight invitation, um, access, to it so uh, please connect um, as of September 15th so you can hear all about it and again thank you so much for taking the time and we hope that um, you'll be back with us again next year yes awesome thank you so much thank you guys have a great day bye, -bye.